Howdy, welcome to Elementary Statistics. I am Lance Curtis, and this is the lecture for Section 6.4, The Central Limit Theorem. Here in this lecture, we're going to talk about some assumptions that we make with the Central Limit Theorem, as well as the conclusions that it allows us to make. We'll talk about conventions about how the Central Limit Theorem is typically used, and then we'll look at adjusting distribution statistics because of the Central Limit Theorem, and then we'll get into some real-world examples of how the central limit theorem is used to solve real-world problems. We'll finish the lecture talking about the correction that we need to make to finite populations. So the central limit theorem essentially tells us that for a population with any distribution, the distribution of the sample means approaches a normal distribution as the sample size increases. Note this is not the values of the distribution itself. This is the sample means from the distribution. And that distribution will approach a normal distribution as you increase its sample size. The central limit theorem forms the foundation for estimating population parameters and hypothesis testing, which we're going to be getting into in future chapters. Now, the central limit theorem does make some assumptions. First, we're assuming that the random variable x has a distribution, which may or may not be normal, but this distribution has a mean value of mu and a standard deviation value of sigma. Simple random samples of all size n are being selected from the population. This is another assumption that we're making. What we're saying is that the samples are selected so that all possible samples of the same size have the same chance of being selected. With these assumptions in place, and if they are true, then the central limit theorem makes the following conclusions. First, we can conclude that the distribution of sample x bar values will, as the sample size increases, approach a normal distribution. We can also conclude that the mean of those sample means is the population mean mu. We can also conclude that the standard deviation of all sample means is sigma divided by the square root of our sample size. This is the adjustment that I was referencing in the previous lecture for standard deviations. We're dividing the, the sample standard deviation by the square root of our sample size. This gives us a better estimator of the population standard deviation. There's some conventions that are in place with how we use the central limit theorem. So the mean of the sample means is typically represented as mu sub x bar. Remember that this is the population mean. So this is the same. So mu sub x bar is simply the same thing as mu because the, the mean of the sample means is an unbiased estimator. It targets well the population mean. Therefore, mu sub x bar is the same as mu. The standard deviation of the sample means is going to be denoted with sigma sub x bar, and that's going to be equal to sigma divided by the square root of the sample size. This value is also called the standard error of the mean. Now, let's go over some commonly used rules for applying the central limit theorem. For samples of size n larger than 30, we can approximate the distribution of the sample means reasonably well by a normal distribution. The approximation becomes closer to a normal distribution as the sample size n becomes larger. So when our sample size exceeds 30, then we can approximate with a normal distribution. If the sample size is less than 30, then we do not approximate with a normal distribution. Now, if the original population is normally distributed, then we don't have that threshold value of 30 to worry about because we're already normally distributed. There's no reason to, to approximate a normal distribution with another normal distribution. 
So for any sample size, the sample means will be normally distributed. It doesn't matter what the sample size is going to be because you're already normally distributed. Let's look at an example, which we already observed, by the way, with we did our work with the rolling dice experiment from the previous lecture. Remember that the probabilities of rolling any one number was a uniform distribution. And this was because the probability of getting any individual outcome was the same. So we would expect that over time, the frequency of getting each individual outcome would be about the same, which would give us a uniform distribution. As we simulated more and more rolls, however, the distribution of the samples became a normal distribution. So this is an example where we would apply the central limit theorem. This is actually saying that we're actually approaching a normal distribution the more, the, the, the more trials we make. The more trials we make, the bigger our sample size, and the bigger our sample size, the more our distribution approximates a normal distribution. So, let's look at some examples and test what we just learned about central limit theorem. Each example that we're going to look at has a population mean mu, population standard deviation sigma, and sample, standard, sample size n. For each example, indicate the distribution type, mean, and standard deviation you should use when calculating probabilities. So if we're given a binomial distribution and our sample size is 67, can we use a normal distribution to approximate or should we just stick with the binomial distribution? What does the central limit theorem say? I'll give you a moment to compose your answer. Well, here note that the sample size is greater than 30. So yes, we can use a normal distribution. The mean value that we're going to use is the same value from from the binomial distribution. The standard deviation, however, we have to adjust by dividing by the square root of 67. And we're dividing by the square root of 67 because 67 is the sample size. So the central limit theorem says that for sample size greater than 30, you can use a normal distribution. Just take the same mean value, adjust your standard deviation, and you'll approximate the given distribution when calculating probabilities. Here's the next example. Let's say we're given a normal distribution with a sample size of one. Can we use a normal distribution to approximate? Well, in this case, we already have a normal distribution. So we just take the values from that distribution and there we go, off, off we're off and running. There's no size threshold for normal distributions. So if you're already starting out with a normal distribution, it doesn't matter what your sample size is. Now, you're not gonna get a, set, a standard deviation value when you've only got a sample size of one. You need at least a second value in order to calculate standard deviation. But the main point is you're already normally distributed, so you don't need to make any adjustment. Uniform distribution, where the sample size of 15. What does the central limit theorem say? Can we use a normal distribution to approximate? And here the answer is going to be no. We're going to stick with the uniform distribution that we have because our sample size 15 is 30 or less. We're under 30, so therefore we can't use the normal distribution to approximate another given distribution. We have to use the one that we're given. Let's take a look at some more examples. Suppose we have a uniform distribution with a sample size of 31. Can we use a normal distribution to approximate? And the answer is yes, we can use a normal distribution to approximate. 
So the mean value that we're going to use is we just keep that the same because mean values are unbiased estimators. Standard deviation, however, is a biased estimator, and so we have to make an adjustment. The adjustment we make is by dividing by the square root of the sample size, which in this case is 31. So here we see a central limit theorem says that for any sample sizes over 30, you can use the normal distribution to approximate the given distribution. Here's our next example. Suppose we have a binomial distribution with a sample size of 15. Can we use a normal distribution to approximate? I hope you said no. We're not going to be using the normal distribution to approximate because our sample size is less than 30. So for any sample size, 30 or less, you cannot use the normal distribution to approximate another given distribution. Suppose we have a normal distribution with a sample size of 15. Now can the central limit theorem allow us to use a normal distribution to approximate? And the answer is yes, you can use the normal distribution to approximate. So what we're going to do, we were already normally distributed, so we're just going to use the same values. However, you're going to find for the problems that you need to solve, you need to make an adjustment in, in your standard deviation value because your sample size is 30 or less. So you can use it. There's no size threshold, but you do need to make that adjustment because the standard deviation is a biased estimator. Here's an example where we're looking at elevators. So suppose an elevator has a maximum capacity of 16 passengers with a total weight of 2,500 pounds force. Assuming weights allow a normal distribution with a mean of 182.9 pounds force and a standard deviation of 40.8 pounds force, what is the probability that a randomly selected person will weigh more than 156.25 pounds force or 1 16th of 2,500. So you're one of 16 passengers that's carrying the total weight of 2,500 pounds force. What's the probability that you're going to weigh more than your quote unquote fair share of the weight? Well, we could go old school and convert our random variable of 156.25 into a z score and then use the z score tables to find the area under the curve which then gives us the probability. But why would we do that? We could be lazy and use software like StackCrunch. And since I'm a lazy engineer, that's exactly what I'm going to be doing. So in StackCrunch, I pull up my normal calculator because it says that we're following a normal distribution. And here I've got a mean value of 182.9. That's here in the problem statement. Standard deviation of 40.8. I put that into, this, into the problem statement. And I'm looking for my random variable 156.25. What's the probability will weigh more than that? So that's going to be my drop down menu from my inequality is going to be greater than or equal to. Hit compute and out comes my probability. I have a 74% chance that that's actually going to happen. Wow. <laughs> that's a, a pretty Pretty fair odds that it's actually you're actually going to be you're actually going to be putting in more than your quote unquote fair share of the weight. If you do it old school, you're going to get the same number, so it doesn't matter which way you go. Either way, probability that your random variable will be greater than 156.25 is 74.3 percent. Let's look at another example where we're looking at the same distribution, but from another aspect. So given the same elevator and passenger weight distribution, what is the probability that a randomly selected sample of 16 people will have a mean weight greater than 156.25 pounds force, which means the weight of the passengers exceeds the maximum capacity of the elevator? If all 16 people weigh more than 1 16th of their share for the maximum weight capacity of the elevator, guess what? this elevator is going gonna, is gonna to snap and all these people are going to fall 
and they're either going to be seriously injured or dead when the elevator hits the bottom. So here we're going to use the central limit theorem to make adjustments in our distribution for calculating our probability. The reason why we're making adjustments is because our sample size is greater than 1. So we have to make an adjustment. So here we have our mu sub x bar, which is the same as mu, our population mean. We're just going to keep the same number that we had before, 182.9. However, for our population standard deviation, we're going to have to make an adjustment. So we take the standard deviation that we're given, the 40.8, and we divide it by the square root of our sample size, which is 16 people that we're taking the sample of. So that gives us a, sig a sigma value of 10.2, which is what we're going to put into our, our stack crunch calculator. So now we're just going to do the same thing that we did before, only now we've got this new value of 10.2 that we put in instead of the 40.8 that was given. And now when we press compute, we get a completely different number. And look at that number, 0.9955. That's the probability that the randomly selected sample of 16 people will have a weight greater than 1 16th, which means you add them all together, and it's very likely that the weight capacity of the elevator will be exceeded. Which means, yeah, we need to redesign our elevator so that it will be safer for use. Let's look at it in another example involving Oscar winners for Best Actress. So if we assume that the ages of Best Actress winners are normally distributed with a mean value of 36 and a standard deviation of 11.08, what then is the probability that one randomly selected Best Actress winner is over 35 years old? Well, in StatCrunch, we're going to put these values into our normal calculator. So here's our mean value. Here's our standard deviation, which we were given here in the problem statement. And we're going to say, what's the probability that we're over 35? So greater than or equal to 35. Press Compute, and out comes our probability, which is... 53.6%. Now what is the probability that 15 randomly selected Best Actress winners are over 35 years old? Now because this number that we're looking for, first we were looking for one, now we're looking for more than one. So now we have to make an adjustment to our standard deviation. So when we put our numbers into StackCrunch, we're going to get a different answer come out to accommodate the 15 people as opposed to just the one. Remember that when that number that you're looking for, that sample size you're taking, is greater than 1, you have to make an adjustment to your standard deviation by dividing by the square root of your sample size. In this case, it's 15, so we have to divide the 11.08, the standard deviation we were given in the problem statement, by the square root of 15. That gives us 2.86, which is the value that we actually end up putting here into StackCrunch. We can do the same sort of thing looking at Best Actor winners instead of Best Actress winners. If we assume that these, these people are normally distributed with a mean value of 44.1 and standard deviation 8.98. What then is the probability that one randomly selected Best Actor winner is under 35 years old? Well, we can look and do the same thing from our normal calculator in StackCrunch put in our values for mean and standard deviation. We want that we're under 35, so it's going to be less than or equal to 35, and then hit compute, and out comes our probability of 15.5%. What is the probability that 12 randomly selected Best Actor winners are under 35 years old? We're going to do the same thing in StackCrunch, but remember, we have to make an adjustment for our standard deviation because now we're looking at a sample size that's greater than 1. So we have to take and that sample size, take the square root, and divide it into the standard deviation that we're given. That gives us the number that we need to plug into StackCrunch. You may have noticed that I'm plugging in different numbers than what's actually listed. So the values that I'm calculating are rounded, but when I put the number into StackCrunch, I'm not using a rounded number. I'm going to get to that into a moment. First, 
Let's answer the question, why do we even have to adjust the standard deviation in the first place when our sample size is greater than 1? Well, remember that standard deviation is a bias estimator. So because the sample value doesn't target the population value, we have to make an adjustment to compensate for that bias in the estimation. Why is it that we all, why don't we also adjust the mean value when the standard deviation is one? Notice that we were always using the same mean value. We never made any adjustments to that. Why is it that sample size is greater than one don't require an adjustment in the mean? Well, remember, in the previous lecture, the mean is an unbiased estimator. So because it's unbiased, we don't need any adjustment to compensate. There's nothing to compensate for. It's going to target well the population parameter. So we don't need to make any adjustment to the mean value. We just take it straight from the problem statement. Now, notice how I was using exacting values there when I put in that new standard deviation. If you use a calculator on your computer and in the Windows operating environment, there's a standard calculator that you can use. Go ahead and calculate your, your new standard deviation in that calculator. And then you can copy and paste the number into StatCrunch so you can get an exact value. Make sure you select everything in the standard deviation field before you paste the new value into it. If all you do is put the cursor in, then when you go to paste the value, it ends up inserting the new value inside the old value. And the, and the number that you have there in the field is gobbledygook. So make sure you select everything in the standard deviation field. And you can do that either by selecting all the numbers with your mouse cursor, or you can put your cursor into the field and then on your keyboard, select Control A. And that's the, that's the command for select all. And then go ahead and paste your value in. And typically the value I use is Control V on the keyboard. Let's look at it in another example involving presidents of the United States and the time that they served in office. So the number of days that a U.S. president serves in office we're going to assume is normally distributed with a mean value of 2030.9 and a standard deviation of 952.14. What then is the probability that one randomly selected U.S. president served less than four years or 1,460 days. Well, in StatCrunch, we put in our mean and standard deviation values into our normal calculator, and then we want the probability that we serve less than four years. So we're going to say less than, not four, but 1,460. Why 1,460 and not the four? We've got to keep our units consistent. So our mean value is 2,030.9. That's not years, that's days. Okay, so we have to use the same unit of measure when we put numbers here into stack crunch so everything's dimensionally consistent. So when we do that, hit the compute and out comes 27.4%. Now what is the probability that 20 randomly selected US presidents served less than four years? So in this question, we have the same values, but remember our sample size is greater than one, so we're going to have to make an adjustment to our standard deviation. So in our normal calculator, notice I have a different number for standard deviation than I did previously. I have to make that adjustment dividing by the square root of the sample size in order to get the right number to come out. So I take the square root of 20 because 20 is my sample size, divide it into the standard deviation I'm given, and that's the new number that I stick in to StackCrunch. We can look at a similar problem involving height measurements of presidents of the United States. So if we assume that the height of U.S. presidents in centimeters is normally distributed with a mean value of 179.7 and a standard deviation of 7.31, we can answer the question, what is the probability that one randomly selected U.S. president has a height between 170 centimeters and 175 centimeters? Just go into stack crunch in your normal calculator Stick in your mean value, your standard deviation value, and we want that we have a height between these two values. So I'm going to select the between option here at the top so I can put two values in. I want between 170 
and 175, so I put those numbers in, hit compute, and out comes my probability, 16.8%. What then is the probability that five randomly selected U.S. presidents have a height between 170 centimeters and 175 centimeters? So I have the same numbers as before, I just have to remember I'm using a different standard deviation. And I have to change that standard deviation because standard deviation is an unbiased S is excuse me. Standard deviation is a bias estimator. And so in order to compensate for the bias in the estimator, I have to divide by the square root of the sample size. So remember to put that new number in when you're calculating for a sample size that's greater than one. Let's look at an example involving M&M packages. The label on a randomly selected package of plain M&Ms containing 465 candies claims that the net weight of the package is 396.9 grams. The candy weights are normally distributed with a mean of 0.857 grams and standard deviation of 0.0152 grams. Those are weights for the individual candies. The weight of the package is the 396.9. Now, if every package has exactly 465 candies in it, then the mean weight of the candies must be greater than 0.854 grams for the net contents to weigh at least 396.9 grams. What I did is I just took the weight that they're claiming for the package and divided it amongst the total number of individual candies in the package. That gives us the weight per individual candy that we have to satisfy in order to get the weight that's actually claimed. First question we're asked here is what is the probability that one randomly selected M&M plain candy weighs more than 0.854 grams? Well, in StackCrunch, in my normal calculator, I'm going to stick in the mean value, the standard deviation, and then here's the value that I actually calculated when I divide it up for the individual candy weight. I want, I want it more than 0.854. That's where that number comes from. So greater than or equal to 0.854. Hit compute and now comes my probability. What is the probability of 465 randomly selected M&Ms have a mean weight of at least 0.854. Well, I have to make an adjustment to my standard deviation, remember, because I have a sample size that's greater than one. So I take that original standard deviation that I was given, divide it by the square root of my sample size, which is 465, and that gets me a really small number that I stick into StackCrunch. Press the compute button, and out comes my probability, which as you can see, is almost one. And for all practical purposes, that's, I mean, that's four nines there after the decimal point. So that's gonna be one by all practical standard deviations. So yeah, it's a pretty sure thing that all the randomly selected, M &M, if you randomly select the same number of M&Ms that you actually put into the bag, the mean weight is going to be enough for it to be what they actually claim on the package. So given these results, does it seem that the package contains what the label claims it contains? And the answer is going to be yes. There's more than a 99% chance that the label is accurate, so the company seems to be doing a very good job of filling the bags. Their quality control process is really, really spot on. Let's look at a redesign problem for ejection seats. There was a time when only men were allowed to be fighter jet pilots. And then the culture changed and women were allowed to become fighter jet pilots. So when that happened, engineers needed to redesign the ejection seats, which had been originally designed for men because only men were the ones who were fighting it. The men weighed between 140 and 211 pounds. So let's say that we have a distribution for, for the weights of women, and it's normally distributed, and the mean value of that distribution is 165.0 pounds and standard deviation of 45.5 pounds. 
First question we're asked is, what is the probability that one randomly selected woman will weigh between 140 pounds and 211 pounds? Well, again, we go into StatCrunch in our normal calculator, put the values that we have in. So for the women, our mean value of our distribution is 165, standard deviation of 45.5. I want to get the probability between 140 and 211. So I'm going to hit that between option at the top so I can put those two values in here, hit the compute, out comes my probability at the end, 0.553. Excuse me. That's the three decimal places. I guess if they want four, you'd say 0.5526. So however many decimal places they want, that's there's your number there. That's what you can give them. Now, the next question is, what is the probability that 36 randomly selected women will weigh between 140 pounds and 211 pounds. Remember, now our sample size is greater than one, so we have to make an adjustment to our standard deviation. Notice I have a different number here for standard deviation, but all the other numbers are the same. So I have to make that adjustment, and the way I do it is by dividing the, the standard deviation that I'm given by the square root of my sample size. That then gives me the correct value as a result when I press compute. Third question we're asked, which probability seems more relevant to the redesign of ejection seats? Is it the probability that one randomly selected woman or is it the probability for 36 randomly selected women? Which probability seems more relevant and why? Well, when you're asking this question, ask yourself, okay, so how many people are actually going to be using the ejection seat at any one given point in time? And the answer is, it's only going to be one. The ejection seat only fits one person at a time. Therefore, the probability for one woman is the more relevant because only one person will be using the ejection seat at any given moment. There's a correction that we have to make for finite population. So, Typically, we're going to be sampling with replacement, but sometimes we sample without replacement, and our sample size n is less than 5% of the finite population size. We learned previously that we can just calculate standard deviation of sample means by making a simple correction, divide by the square root of the sample size. However, when we sample without replacement and the sample size is greater than 5% of the finite population size, then we need to make a different adjustment to our standard deviation. And we have to add in the correction factor that you see here on the screen. So not only are we dividing the standard deviation by the square root of our sample size, but we have to multiply it by the square root of the difference between the population size and the sample size divided by one less than the population size. This correction factor needs to be included into our calculation in order to get the right standard deviation for calculating probabilities. That then brings us to the end of this lecture. If you have any questions, you know what to do. Otherwise, I will see you in class for the next video. Thanks for watching.